G'day viewers, my name's Scott. I'm from Sydney, Australia, and I work with Battlefield Vegas in the Heavy Hitters program. Basically, today we're gonna to talk about what we do, and then we're gonna take you for a little tour through our workshop. Basically, uh, as Battlefield grew and began to move a lot more of our operations outdoors into the more heavier caliber stuff, including tanks, uh, a real need arose to have uh, a specialist area where um, we, we could get a little bit more continuity with with uh, the stuff that's basically the, the heavier area of weaponry. So the heavy hitters was created essentially to handle everything at battlefield from 20 millimeter above, including specialist weapons such as flamethrowers. In addition to that, we do tank restoration, heavy fabrication, and things of that nature. So yeah, let's let's take a walk through what we do and. Yeah, starting from the bottom, uh, we have our 20 mil Lardy, which does shoot frequently as a rental. Uh, you guys are familiar, I'm sure, with our 20 millimeter Vulcan. On that note, we have a new project in the works, the M197 20 mil Vulcan, which is actually the three barrel version uh, that is currently under restoration at the moment. Moving along, uh, we have a very exciting project here. So this is the British 30 millimeter Aiden cannon. This, this cannon was designed specifically for aircraft. It can be mounted sideways, upside down, right ways up. And it is a revolver cannon, but the interesting part is it is a single barrel that sits forward of a revolver, just like a, like a revolver pistol. We have our rounds ammunition here. So it is a very similar round to the 30 mil that is in the A10, just a little shorter in length, uh, but it, this, this thing is brutal. It is um, gonna be a very exciting project to do. Interestingly, this one is cocked pneumatically with air. So that's gonna be one of the challenges we're gonna have to overcome to get this one going. Moving along uh, down here, we have very basic standard 37 millimeter US. Um, <clears throat> so this was a, early war anti-tank gun. And we have one of these out on the line that rents out frequently. Moving along, then we move up to 40 millimeter Bofors. So this is just the projectile uh, standard fuse, which would go in the top there. Uh, the fuse has obviously changed from proximity to timed, etc. As you can see the projectile here, it is not completely uh, coated in um, copper or brass. You have what's called a driving band and this section here is essentially what cuts into the rifling. And as you can see, the rest of it is steel. So when you are moving into the larger calibers, uh, the, the driving band is what changes as according to what most people know about frequent uh, small arms reloading. So this becomes very important as we move up in caliber. Then moving into the well-known Sherman. Uh, currently at Battlefield, we have two kinds of Sherman tank. We have the M50 Israeli. Super Sherman, which just featured at the Big Sandy shoot for 2021. And that is a very large, high velocity 75 round. And then moving down, we have the US World War II 75 Sherman. It's a, a much smaller, low velocity round, but it had a very different purpose on the battlefield as opposed to the high velocity 75. Um, in, in this game, uh, you got to understand you can't buy things brand new out of the factory, out of the box uh, anymore. So we have various sources for our ammunition. And as you can see, they're in various uh, states along the way here. Some of them we actually have to remanufacture and machine to get to spec um, before we actually shoot those. And then we have some examples of some rounds here that are actually manufactured from scratch through one of our contractors. Moving down, we have the 76 Sherman tank. This one is uh, not yet in our arsenal, but uh, a lot of you that are into World War II tanks, really briefly, that is the difference case size from your standard low velocity 75 Sherman and then the high velocity 76 mil Sherman. A lot of you have seen Fury, uh, the movie Fury. This was the tank, the main tank was the 76. Uh, we are working on a 76 mil Sherman project. This is an original uh, World War II uh, Sherman uh, 75 round. So when you, when you do this, when a new tank or new weapon system comes into our, uh, into our area, uh, 
It's always handy to have at least one original projectile that you can mic out and actually pull specifications off. So we have an actual original fuse here where the gunner would adjust his timing and range, etc. at the front here. There's that driving band that we talked about and then the steel component of the projectile itself into the case. So having this on hand before we actually develop our load is uh, very handy for getting various measurements that we need off an original round that was designed to shoot through that weapon system. <clears throat> All right, moving along into the slightly bigger stuff, coming lower down here. This is the infamous 105 L7. So this one is one of our hottest rentals right now, our M60A1 tank. Um, this one shoots all the time at Battlefield. And an example of uh, this round is we have our case there. So you can see already we're getting a much bigger and then our current projectile style that we're shooting. So you can already see the difference here. Two, one. So a good point to note is we don't shoot typical tank rounds here in terms of uh, we don't shoot high explosive, we don't shoot heat, any of that stuff. Generally, we're using just a steel slug, uh, but we can arrange special events on request to, to actually blow up a car or things of that nature. The rounds for this are actually electronically fired. Uh, in layman's terms, instead of a, a percussion primer, uh, when the breech closes on this one, the firing pin actually rests on the primer and then an electrical current goes through it and the electricity actually sets off the, uh, the round. So there is an essence of reliability and simplicity in that, but that does also create some more complexities during the restoration process. <clears throat> okay, moving along, this is a very exciting one here. This is a round for our T62. This thing is a monster. This is the world's first smoothbore tank. Um, this was developed post-World War II in the 60s, 70s. And uh, as you can see, it is uh, quite a ferocious round, especially for anything you can shoot in the civilian world. And it's gonna be the largest firing tank in private hands that we know of. It'll also be the first smooth ball that anybody has successfully developed a load for and shoots frequently. So when we talk about smooth ball really briefly, it's just like a shotgun, there is no rifling, it's, it's all smooth. Uh, but in addition to that, you have to create a fin stabilized round because without that rifling, the round is no longer going to be spinning in flight. So one of the complexities for us is we have to, you can't get rounds for this now anywhere in the US. So we are having to start from scratch and develop a specific load and a specific type of am uh, ammunition and round for this tank. So one of the challenges is gonna be we are gonna to have to make the fin stabilized uh, area of that round in house here and develop that round ourselves. So stand by and stay tuned for that one. Moving further along, we have the 122 millimeter D30. Uh, that one has been featured at Big Sandy twice now. One. It's, a, it's a small case, but it is a heavy charge and uh, an interesting part about this gun is it's what we refer to at Battlefield as a bag load. So essentially the projectile is not pushed into the case and crimped. The projectile goes into the gun first and then the charge goes in behind it. So it's similar to our 155. However, our 155 features a material like a canvas charge bag. This one actually sits inside a case, but the round does not crimp into the front there. It's good for saving on case life, that's for sure. Two, one! <laughs> okay, you have seen our 155, not much to show off up here, but there are some spares in there for uh, mostly the breech and our consumable components. And then we have a reloadable primer set up for that gun. And then moving down this way, you can see 
As the 155 shoots quite frequently, we have a big surplus of rounds for it. <coughs> so that is a 155 projectile. Each one of these that we shoot is a collector's item typically. And again, there's that, that driving band that we talked about right down the bottom there. So then moving over here to some of our specialist weapons, we have uh, several flamethrowers that rent out quite frequently at Battlefield. I would recommend anybody, if you have the chance to join that very small club of people out there who have shot a flamethrower, you need to go and do that because getting behind this thing is, uh, it's, it's unexplainable. It's uh, something I never would have imagined. Um, and the heat is just intense and it, it was a devastating weapon in its time. And we've actually, one of the rewarding parts about this job is we have taken something that is designed purely to kill and we found another use for it uh, and it provides uh, entertainment, it brings people together and it actually, it shares some of the historical uh, stuff in there and we've created another use for it essentially. So that's really good. So getting into the specifics, uh, we have our standard rental flamethrower is an M9 Vietnam era flamethrower. Traditionally in the military during wartime, they use what's called napalm, uh, which is, it, it's not dangerous if it's used correctly, but uh, the reality is shooting napalm is just not as exciting as uh, what we use here. What we use here is a diesel mixture, and it just creates much more of a ferocious fireball. Um, but overall, the general safety of using diesel is, um, it's far safer than using napalm and it's honestly it's more exciting so moving down this unit here is a very special this is an m3 bow gun flamethrower world war ii era um, this one was purchased for our iwo jima sherman uh, this will go into a 1919 mount as it features a 1919 trunnion so this is the m3 bow gun flamethrower unit it is a u.s made World War II uh, unit and as I said there are very little of these left in existence and uh, I only know of one other out there that is actually in firing condition. You can even see we have the original tag on there from the chemical core and M3 flamethrower. So the way this works is it pins into a 1919 trunnion so you could shoot this off a 1919 tripod and uh, we have and it will also mount up into any one of the 1919 spots inside a Sherman tank. So rather than a uh, traditional flamethrower, the way this one works is there is actually a fuel cell in the top here, and this is for your igniter flame. So there's a small amount of fuel in here, which is actually pressurized by hand. And then that runs a giant flame out of the front here, like a piezo burner. And then once you have that puppy ignited, you just hit the trigger here and you have uh, Compared to the backpack mounted flamethrower, you have an intense amount of uh, throw, distance, range and heat with this thing. So, very special and uh, sometime soon it will be available in one of our World War II packages. And then if you pan down here, that's the tank grip for it that actually mounts up inside the tank. So we have our fuel component here and then you have your pressure inside there. Uh, interestingly, we also have an original uh, World War II flamethrower service kit. So this kit was actually issued out in the field and it comes with all this stuff for basically servicing flamethrowers. So yeah, we do take our uh, maintenance stuff here seriously and if we want to, we can go all original. And uh, that's basically it. you enjoyed the tour of the shop here today uh, remember most of this stuff is available for rent so if you want to come out here and get your gun off so to speak uh, let's go into some of the heavier stuff and give us a call